In a previous video, we discussed the village of Hamlet and described it as the first Dungeons & Dragons adventure for many old school players. In this episode, we'll be discussing another adventure by Gary Gygax, the author behind the Hamlet module and co-creator of D&D as a whole. This module came out the same year as Hamlet in 1979. It will go on to become an even greater common entry point into Dungeons & Dragons, possibly cementing it as the most played D&D adventure ever. In this episode, we discuss The Keep on the Borderlands. Hello and welcome to DM It All, a show where we discuss D&D books and tabletop gaming history. In this episode, we'll be discussing D&D Basic's most famous adventure. D&D Basic was meant as a teaching tool for newer players, so the box sets often included a free module to help new dungeon masters run their first adventure. The first of these modules was In Search of the Unknown, an adventure that left many elements up to the dungeon master to customize. It was replaced with The Keep on the Borderlands, which remained the packaged module for D&D Basic until 1983. In Search of the Unknown was created before there was really a standard way of designing D&D modules, while the Keep on the Borderlands helped set the standard going forward. It provided a much more fully stocked dungeon plus town section to explore. D&D Basic has often been cited as one of the best-selling D&D editions of all time, which helped provide the Keep on the Borderlands with arguably the widest market saturation out of any D&D module. When Gary Gygax created The Village of Hamlet, he intended it to be the introduction to a larger adventure still to come, and since that adventure took years to release, many players simply made their own sequels. The Keep on the Borderlands, on the other hand, was always meant to be a starting point for whatever setting or campaign that the Dungeon Master cooked up. This module could easily fit into most D&D worlds, so much so that it's actually had its official setting changed multiple times. The original was assumed to be set in Mistara, the default setting for D&D Basic. 2nd edition D&D released a sequel that placed the keep within the world of Greyhawk, the same setting as the Village of Hamlet. This was also the setting for the 3rd edition novelization of The Keep on the Borderlands. 4th edition finally placed the keep in the Forgotten Realms, which is now the default setting for modern D&D. So don't be afraid to throw it into Dragonlance or Exandria, though it might take a bit of work to fit into Spelljammer. As usual, there will be spoilers in this module walkthrough. If you want to just skip ahead to our final thoughts, jump ahead to the time shown here. To get into the story behind the Keep on the Borderlands, we need to first describe alignment and morality within the D&D Basic system. D&D Basic had a simple threefold alignment system that categorized characters solely on whether they were lawful, neutral, or chaotic. This defined how much they skewed towards order and the greater good, rather than their own selfish whims. While other D&D systems had a second axis of morality, creating combinations like lawful evil and chaotic good, D&D Basic kept it basic. Chaos was evil, and law was good. Most monster races in D&D were therefore chaotic, as they sought to enslave the more lawful elves, dwarves, and humanoid races. The titular Keep on the Borderlands is an isolated structure literally set on the threshold between the narrow realm of mankind and the hostile territory surrounding it. It is essentially the front line of defense against the forces of chaos, and many adventurers seek it out in the hopes of attaining glory and gold. This is, of course, how the player characters enter the picture. The ironic thing about the Keep on the Borderlands is that there is not much to do in the Keep itself. This is partially due to the Gygaxian design behind this module, as Gygax laid out his villages more like living quarters than a video game quest hub. Gygax preferred to stage his adventures in believable worlds with an open sandbox format. The keep and the people within it serve as background details to be called upon when necessary. It's the players who get to decide which NPCs become relevant, rather than letting a scripted plot ferry them along. The DM obviously had a huge role in shaping the narrative as well, especially because modules back then often called upon the Dungeon Master to customize the town and dungeons. D&D's publisher at the time realized there was a demand for scripted adventures, but they also wanted to encourage players to make up their own stories especially because D&D Basic as a system was reliant on DM interpretation rather than rigidly following the rulebook. So the published modules in the early years would frequently leave out content so that the Dungeon Master could make up some material instead. 
The Keep on the Borderlands is a decent example of this philosophy, as it is still a complete adventure despite missing a couple of elements. The few customizable features have become infamous though, such as the fact that none of the NPCs possess any names. It was assumed the DM would come up with the names and nature for most of the NPCs. In fact, the module even provides a number table in order to randomly generate NPC stats and personalities on the spot. The more important NPCs do have set personalities, though they're still in need of a name. More importantly, the locations within the keep are ripe with detail. The keep is a very easy town to explore due to its compact and functional nature. Many modules at this time featured a lot of pointless farmhouses strewn across the land, but most of the structures within the keep of the borderlands can serve some function within a campaign. Almost all the shops have something useful to offer, and some of the stores even have their own custom stock. This smartly gives the party a lot of opportunities to talk to NPCs in a natural way, instead of expecting them to knock on the doors of random houses. By visiting the shops, parties can pick up rumors determined by a random number table. Many of these rumors offer useful advice for later in the adventure, though the party can pick up some false rumors as well. Of course, amoral player characters might be interested in the keep section of the module, as there is plenty of treasure hidden within town. This is where the keep's military locations might come into play, as there are a lot of passages describing the keep's defenses and guard routines. There's also enough keep information here for heroic campaigns to create some custom battles against hostile invaders. Remember that this module was meant to be a starting point for a custom campaign, which includes a campaign that might escalate into full-scale war. While there are no scripted events in the town, there is some sense of progression for the party's reputation within the keep. The Castellan, aka the Governor, will grant the party access to more fortified military locations depending on their actions. If the party performs a great altruistic feat, they will be invited to a large banquet within the inner bailey of the keep. If the party impresses the Castellan, he will ask the party to undergo a special mission for him. It is up to the DM to come up with all the specifics for this exchange, but this will be a logical place to introduce the Caves of Chaos a nearby den full of chaotic creatures, functioning as the dungeon for this module. The Castellan is willing to send some soldiers to help the party, and this is an offer the party should definitely take advantage of. Even though this is an introductory module, it is still written by Gary Gygax, and the party will need all the cannon fodder they can take. If the party has not won the graces of the Castellan yet, they can find more allies in the nearby tavern. Here they can hire mercenaries or find like-minded adventurers to join them. Adventurers are higher level than mercenaries, but they take a percentage of treasure rather than a steady paycheck. There's also a 1 in 6 chance for these random adventurers to be secretly chaotic. These aren't the only chaotic characters that frequent this tavern either, as there is also an evil priest visiting the town. While this priest seems friendly, he and his silent acolytes are spies from the Caves of Chaos. They have infiltrated the town to sabotage any adventurers heading to the caves. They will insist on joining the party before betraying them at the most opportune moment. Included in this module is a wilderness map that showcases the lands between the Keep and the Caves of Chaos. This map also provides some optional side quests to explore. The party can go raid the nesting ground of some lizard men, bandits, or giant spiders. But the most intense wilderness encounter is the mad hermit living in the woods with his pet mountain lion. The hermit is a level 3 thief that will try to backstab for double damage, and his pet mountain lion always goes first in combat, attacking three times in a single round. This is the first of many encounters in this module, where an unsuspecting level 1 party, likely with single digit health, can be easily wiped out. A strange location included in this keep is titled the Cave of the Unknown. This dungeon lives up to its name, as it is unknown to everyone, including Gary Gygax. This is some of the custom content we mentioned before, that dungeon masters are supposed to create on their own. It could be argued that this is essentially content that's missing from the module, but it's really not a big deal considering the sprawling size of the module's real dungeon. Speaking of... Past the Caves of the Unknown, the party will reach a steep and ominous ravine where the Caves of Chaos are located. Inside the ravine are several cave entrances that the party can freely enter. The caves are home to six different humanoid races that do not get along. 
The orcs are warring with the goblins and hobgoblins. The gnolls are occasionally allied with the orcs. The kobolds try to hide from any conflict. And the bugbears just pick off any free meals they can find. This tribal warfare is one of the most common criticisms of this module, as it's unlikely half a dozen conflicting races would manage to survive to this point in such close proximity. The party can luckily use the racial divisions here to their advantage and set each race against each other. This factional element is common in a lot of Gygax modules, allowing players to employ a bit of diplomacy in their adventures. Unfortunately, since all of the monsters are on such high alert, most of them will simply attack anyone on sight. Basic D&D uses a morale mechanic for enemies during battle, meaning clever players can capture fleeing monsters to pry them for information about the civil war. One interesting aspect about this module is that Gygax encourages the Dungeon Master to also take prisoners. The monsters can ransom defeated player characters instead of just killing them, since they're in dire need of extra funds that can bolster their forces. Gygax usually like to run his monsters as rational thinking creatures rather than mindless club swinging obstacles, and here he recommends that newbie Dungeon Masters do the same. That makes the diplomacy elements the big feature that can prevent the Caves of Chaos from becoming a repetitive hack and slash dungeon crawl. There is no set progression to this dungeon, as the party can visit any cave at any time. For this video, we're just going to focus on the weaker monsters first and work our way up. That starts us with the Kobolds, a tiny lizard-like race that tries to make up for their physical frailty by utilizing traps and ambushes. As the party approaches the Kobold entrance, there's a 2 in 6 chance that kobolds will spring forth from the surrounding trees. If the party manages to enter the cave, they will quickly come across a pit trap. If any party members fall into the pit, the trap will quickly seal itself to imprison any victims. To make matters worse, the sound of the trap going off will alert a nearby guard room, as well as 18 giant rats that are allied with the kobolds. One of the guards on duty will also try to alert the rest of the kobold camp. If the party is unable to stop him, he'll summon 30 kobolds from the common room area. If it's the treasure room the party seeks, they can actually avoid the common area entirely, utilizing stealth. Once there, they'll just have to complete a mini-boss fight with the kobold chieftain and the five kobold women that surround him at all times. Many of the bosses in this dungeon have two or more mates that double as bodyguards. Opposite the kobolds, the party can find the second weakest of the humanoid monsters, the goblins. The goblin entrance has multiple guard stations in close proximity, but the real threat is the ogre in the nearby cave. The goblins actually have a secret passage to this ogre cave, and if troubled, they'll pay him for his help in their defenses. The good news is that the party can also bribe the ogre, paying him to return to his cave without a fight. Unfortunately, the party will not be able to avoid the common room this time if they want to reach the chieftain's quarters. Clearing out the common room will have the party stumbling upon some defenseless goblin children. Since the Caves of Chaos are home to the monsters and their offspring, expect some arguments at the table regarding the morality of monster infanticide. Are children of evil races inherently evil? If left alone, will the children grow up and seek vengeance for their dead parents? Can a character still be considered lawful if they slaughter unarmed youths? Look upon the moral morass of D&D's alignment system and weep, as it's been known to drive entire sessions, and even campaigns, to a standstill. Setting aside the kid-killing quandary, when the party arrives at the storage room, they have a decent chance of running into some hobgoblins. Hobgoblins are the beefier goblin cousins, and this hobgoblin tribe has been routinely stealing from their supposed allies. They access the goblin storage room through a secret entrance, and the party can use this entrance as a backdoor into the hobgoblin den. This is a hidden section of the hobgoblin base, where the party can easily find the hobgoblin chief. To access the rest of the hobgoblin dungeon, the party will have to backtrack to the front entrance, or find the secret door to the armory. It's obviously worth visiting the armory for some extra loot, but accessing the main section of the hobgoblin base will also allow the party to free some prisoners in the torture room as well. Most of the prisoners will either fight alongside the party or reward them with treasure. The one exception is an insane knoll that will simply attack his rescuers. Directly opposite the hobgoblin base are the orc caves, and we do mean caves, plural, as there are actually two separate orc tribes living in this area. The first orc cave features an entryway decorated with decapitated heads and skulls. On display are the heads of dwarves, elves, and a lone orc. But the orc trophy is secretly an orc sentry, poking his head out of a hidden guard post. After the party passes him, he will put a goblin head in his place and try to alert other guards in nearby rooms. 
The forces he manages to rally will then try to flank and ambush the party. If the party reaches the orc chieftain, there is a chance the leader will have used the secret exit to escape to the other orc tribe. If they're unable to find the secret passage, the party will have to enter the second orc camp through the front door. Here, they are likely to fall victim to a heavy net trap that falls upon them as soon as they enter. To make matters worse, the net has metal chimes which will alert the nearby rooms. No matter which orc chieftain the party slays first, the survivors will inevitably migrate and rally behind the other leader. If both chieftains are dead, the survivors might move in with their tenuous allies, the hyena-like gnolls. This is somewhat of a far-fetched conclusion, since the Knoll Lair is situated in the midst of Goblin territory, the group the orcs are at war with. Of note here is the most unique trap in the module. The Knoll storage room has ale leaking onto the floor. The smell has an enticing aroma, but any character that drinks from it is likely to immediately become drunk. Not only will this hamper a character's combat ability, but they'll be so boisterous that they'll alert enemies in the nearby rooms. The strongest humanoid race in the caves are by far the bugbears, and as such they should probably be tackled later. Bugbears are closely related to the goblin race, but they're considerably beefier, hairier, and even sneakier. The party will get a good example of this sneaky behavior if they visit the guard room near the entrance. Here they will find three bugbears cooking some shish kebabs over a smoking brazier. The bugbears will offer their treats to the party as a gesture of goodwill, right before using the skewers to quite literally skewer the party. The bugbears have the smallest humanoid population within the Caves of Chaos, while somehow maintaining the most prisoners. By visiting the slave pens, the party can free a wide array of potential allies. In this dungeon, it is usually a bad idea to trust creatures of a chaotic race, but there is an exception to that rule in the prison area. While most of the kobolds, goblins, and orcs within these cells will simply run away at first opportunity, there is one rebel bugbear that despises his former allies enough to help clear out the rest of the caves. Ironically, it's his human cellmate that should not be trusted, as his long imprisonment has rendered him berserk. The man's bloodlust gives him a 50% chance to attack friends instead of foes, and he will eventually decide to just kill the party and take their treasure anyway. If the party cleaves their way through the bugbear lair, the retreating bugbears will seek the aid of a minotaur. Yes, there is a minotaur within this module, and his neighboring cave is something of a maze. His lair is not all that complicated, but the labyrinth is actually enchanted so that the party will lose all sense of direction while within it. Remember that back then it was common for the players to have a designated map maker draw out a map as the dungeon master described the dungeon. In this instance, the dungeon master would start telling the map maker erroneous directions so the party has no idea where they're headed. The Minotaur is also one of the strongest monsters in this module, but if the party manages to find and defeat him, they'll be properly rewarded with a massive treasure haul. There are two final caves worth noting in this module that are generally avoided by the other creatures. One is a stench-ridden area filled with rotting corpses. This is the home of an owl bear, a monster that is exactly what it sounds like. It is a bit weaker than the Minotaur, but it's also a lot easier to stumble upon by accident at lower levels. There is also a shallow pool in this cave that holds an expensive goblet, but the party will have to fight some grey ooze monsters in order to reach it. These creatures attempt to dissolve the party's equipment before eventually dissolving their flesh and bones. So with all those areas taken care of, we can finally discuss the last cave and this module's second surprise plotline, the Shrine of Evil Chaos. The entrance to this cave features red sculpted walls, with bulging black veins running as a pattern through them. There is also an ominous silence so pervasive that footsteps alone will be enough to alert the monsters within. The main enemies in this area are zombies, skeletons, and the evil clerics that built this place. Anyone not dressed in the black and red clerical garb will be attacked on sight by undead monsters. One corner of the dungeon features a small altar area with blood-stained ritual items. The items are obviously valuable, but anyone who touches them must roll a saving throw. Failing the die roll makes the victim become incredibly possessive over the item they touched. Passing the saving throw makes the character aware that the object is pure evil and that it should be dropped immediately. 
If the character holds on to the object for too long, their alignment will gradually change to chaotic until they eventually devote themselves to the dark masters of this shrine. Magic can cure the victim, but this must be done quickly. If no one casts a dispelling effect within six days of the possession, the victim will become permanently evil. From the altar, the path splits in two, with one route leading to the main temple area for this shrine, while the other leads to some storage. These storage areas include the crypt and prison sections of this dungeon, and both rooms house some powerful monsters. The crypt area houses a level draining white, while the prison section confines a Medusa monster. The Medusa will call out to the party for help and present herself as a fair maiden in distress. She will try to cover her face until the party enters her cell, at which point she'll gaze at the heroes, likely turning a few to stone. The Medusa will offer to cure any petrified heroes, so long as the rest of the party frees her from her chains. The Medusa isn't lying about needing help. She is next to be ritually sacrificed to some sort of demon, but she has no intention of giving out her cure for petrification. Instead, she will betray her rescuers immediately upon being unchained, making this the deadliest fight in the entire module. Players will be able to cure their petrified allies upon winning the fight, but the party is likely to suffer casualties due to the Medusa's poison. Anyone bitten by the Medusa's snakes has to succeed a saving throw or die instantly. And remember, back in D&D Basic, players didn't get death saving throws. They just got new character sheets. When the party makes it to the main temple area, they'll come upon rows of pews, an ivory throne, and a large iron bell. As soon as the party enters the room, candles will magically come to life and illuminate the area with a disgusting red glow. Shapeless forms will dance in the light, and staring at this phenomenon will compel characters to make a saving throw. Failing the saving throw will make the victim perform an evil chant. If three people begin chanting, the iron bell will gradually start to ring. This iron bell will then summon up to 40 undead creatures from an adjacent room. Any amount of chanting will be enough to alert the chief cleric within his lavish private quarters. He can also ring the bell manually to summon his allies. If the party has already wiped out most of the dungeon before they reach the cleric, he will instead just drop everything and skedaddle. If the party follows him through his secret escape tunnel, the tunnel will spew forth gold in an attempt to distract them with wealth. The cleric will then take a potion of gaseous form and fly through a collapsed tunnel. This tunnel does not actually lead anywhere, but Gygax suggests this spot could be a logical entrance into the Cave of the Unknown. So failing to capture the priest at least provides a good hook for the Dungeon Master's next adventure. The entire shrine area in general feels like it's sowing the seeds to a deeper plotline, as it has little to do with the rest of the dungeon. The module also doesn't explain the motives behind the cultists, nor the lore behind their dark religion. This is probably another aspect that is left up to the dungeon master to figure out, but the twisted ending definitely adds a dash of intrigue that will incite players onto their next adventure. <laughs> The Keep on the Borderlands is a very standard D&D story in almost every way. There's not much new here if you've already played The Village of Hamlet or some of the other low-level D&D modules. But that's more of the appeal behind this adventure rather than a flaw. Its adherence to simple design helps set the standard going forward for D&D modules. There were many adventures that tried to follow up on The Keep while also tossing more exotic elements into the mix. The modern sequels and revisions to The Keep tried to add more to the lore, as well as flesh out enemy motivations. However, the original Keep on the Borderlands will remain the best way to capture the old school experience, not only because it introduced so many players to old school D&D, but because it did so very effectively. The Keep on the Borderlands features most of the classic low-level monsters in a very archetypal D&D adventure that can mold itself to any setting. The Keep itself is a well-thought-out, iconic location, that serves as a great starting point for any adventure. This module is also written as a teaching tool and is still an excellent way to get used to the old school rules. The pages thankfully repeat a lot of information from the main rulebooks, which makes it a lot easier to refer back to for specific details. Additionally, Gygax gives a lot of his own personal advice for dungeon masters who might be interested in replicating his style. Gygax liked to view the dungeon master as a neutral arbiter, and he suggested that players be punished for their mistakes when it made sense to do so. 
This approach might not be for everyone, and new players might not enjoy the surprise spikes of difficulty in this introductory module. But difficulty and Gygaxian design were very crucial to the old school D&D experience, which is perhaps why this module has become one of the cornerstones of D&D's grand legacy. Thank you for watching DM It All. Were you one of the many people to run this adventure? Do you think it still holds up? Comment down below with your thoughts and subscribe if you're new here. You can also support us on Patreon if you're feeling extra generous. And as a reminder, we're supported per video, not per month. Thanks again, and we'll see you all next session.